Welcome to Law and Justice. I'm Jane Mulcahy. This is a special series on the topic of relationships matter. And today I'm really, really pleased to be joined by Lawrence Jones. Hi, Lawrence, how are you? I'm good, thanks. So I ask everyone really, before we get into the, the subject matter of the podcast to tell me a little bit about themselves. So can you tell me a bit about yourself, please? Gosh, okay. Um... <laughs> I'm currently working as a um, psychologist, head of psychology at um, a high secure hospital uh, in the UK, um, Rampton Hospital. Um, I'm qualified as, dual qualified as a clinical and forensic psychologist um, and have worked there for getting on for 20 years. <laughs> wow. Uh, totally institutionalized. <laughs> Uh, before that, I did um, uh, uh, when I, I started out uh, as a psychologist in uh, working as a forensic psychologist and worked in um, in prisons um, and worked at, in fact at Wormwood Scrubs in London. Oh, wow, I was there. It was my last visit to the UK before lockdown. In fact, was to Wormwood oh, well. Scrubs. <laughs> Well, so it used to have a therapeutic community in uh, in there. Um, doesn't anymore, but. Um, uh, that's where I used to used to work, um, and also did my training there. Right. Um, and um, Lawrence, and how did you get into forensic psychology? And maybe what's actually the difference between clinical psychology and forensic psychology? Oh wow, well, that's that's a controversial <laughs> question. Uh, <laughs> um, so okay, well, I'll start with your first first bit of your question. Um, I started, I think, um, probably a long time ago, actually, with my interest in psychology as a sort of teenager. Um, I was thinking about this. Um, uh, I think it was actually seeing a film um, about um, uh, the early uh, Sigmund Freud. Okay. I don't know if you, you know the history of Freud's development, but right at the beginning of his career, he was um, interested in trauma in a much more sort of significant way. Mm hmm and this film sort of highlight. it was, a, I don't know, it was a 1960s film or something, and it talked a lot about that early stage of his development. Okay. I remember being really interested in that and, uh, and well, and I suppose psychotherapy generally, and that sort of got me interested in psychology. And then I did a psychology degree, which is only partly, I mean, those days psychology was, uh, there was lots of rats involved. <laughs> <laughs> I think there still is. Yeah, well, there still is to some extent, but... You'd go around psychology departments and there'd be banks of cages full of rats and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there was um, a group experience there as well that was useful. And then after that, um, uh, pretty much by chance, actually, I got a job um, in a hostel um, uh, working with ex-offenders, okay. which is a really interesting project. Um, it's run by somebody who... Um, uh, uh, was from the personal construct uh, uh, theory approach to psychology, um, uh, and it was run as a ther small therapeutic community. Um, and I learned a huge amount there. Um, uh, not always an easy job. We were working with um, uh, ex, uh, well, people who are hard to place. So right. people who'd committed arson, murder, um, who'd come out of high secure hospitals after they were going back into the community. So. Mm. Um, really quite um, a difficult group of people to work with. Um, and uh, watching that, uh, well, being part of that, but also watching the way in which, um, sadly, numbers of those people were relapsing quite um, seriously, got me thinking about, because I started off finding flats and houses for people. And, right, uh, <laughs> the practical stuff, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, you, you, they need accommodation and money. Yeah. And I still think that's really important, actually. Yeah. But... Uh, and neglected because uh, mm. we just throw people out into sort of traumatizing environments mm. and expect them to deal with it. Um, but uh, I realized that, you know, once they got their flats, you know, they'd come back, so sadly, some of them, uh, you know, within a month and say, well, actually, we smashed it up or we yeah. full of people using crack after us <laughs> a yeah. couple of months or something. And, and I realized that there was a little bit more that we needed to do. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I decided to go down the, the forensic psychology route and there was uh, funding for that. So that's when I went into the prison service and trained as a forensic psychologist. Uh, 
I guess that's yeah, basically the routine. And is there a, a specific pathway into forensic psychology in the UK? I don't think there is in Ireland. So um, do, do you have to do a specific bit of additional training or and forensic means prison? Isn't that correct? Yes. Well, yeah. uh, it used to mean just primarily prison, but now forensic psychologists work in high secure hospitals as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, there is a specific training uh, funded by, um, originally anyway, fun funded by uh, the prison service. Um, <clears throat> uh, sort of, you'd get a job and then you'd be paid to train in, in service, as it were. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, so at the end, what I did was a thing called statement of equivalence where you could convert, because working in the NHS, which is what I chose to do eventually, uh, in a hospital setting, you had to um, be a clinical psychologist. Okay. I converted to cl clinical, but now um, hospitals take forensics and clinical, secure hospitals take forensics and clinicals. So on to the second bit of your question. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember it. Um, the differences are quite interesting. I mean, I think it, uh, different courses are very different. Um, so some forensic courses are more um, closer to clinical than others, I guess. Um, there's also, just to complicate things, the clinical psychology division of the British Psychological Society has got a forensic section. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. And uh, when I was, I was chair of the division of forensic psychology at one point, and I used to make jokes about setting up a clinical division of the... <laughs> yeah. There's a kind of competition stuff going on as well yeah. between those. Um, and, uh, but that's not so much of an issue now, I don't think. Um, I suppose forensics could be caricatured because I think it would be caricaturing. They're all very different. But if you were to, it would be forensic psychologists have skills and expertise in thinking about offending behaviour yeah. and um, so-called risk assessment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, where does offending behaviour come from? Um, what do you do to try and change offending behaviour? Um, that sort of thing. Uh, whereas clinical, it's much more generally about mental health right. uh, uh, issues, uh, which all are very relevant to um, some kinds of offending. Mm -hmm. um, and so on a clinical training, you maybe have a few small modules on a forensic, um, forensic work, working forensic settings. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I teach on some clinical courses and I, I do some of that. Whereas on a forensic, obviously you specialise mainly in... Um, uh, thinking about offending, what to do about it, how to do risk assessments, working with staff, um, prison, uh, working in prisons and secure settings generally. Yeah, that's very interesting. So with the forensic then, um, given that, like, I presume in most prisons in the world, a lot of the, um, the people in prison there also have some kind of mental health challenges maybe, or, or in Ireland, there's quite high rates anyway, particularly among the, the, the female population. But then when you add in things like ADHD and other issues now, um, it, it's quite rife. But is the focus then of the therapeutic work of the forensic psychologist specifically targeting the offending behavior and other mental health needs are kind of more to the side? Or it, do you try and take a holistic approach or does it probably depend on the person? It depends on the setting okay. of the person um, and, uh, <clears throat> and the time, I suppose. Uh, historically, I think there was a tendency for forensics just to focus on, you know, men were bad and you had to sort them out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And uh, we wouldn't work, you know, it wasn't sort of cruel uh, the way we, the people would work, but there was a tendency, for instance, not to talk about trauma. You'd see that as excuse making. And yeah. uh, people who did it were seen as sort of buying into that whole narrative and pink and fluffy and <laughs> right, right, right. That, that kind of thing, which I had trouble with. Um, but uh, interestingly, there are some really pioneering and radical approaches in the, uh, uh, um, the uh, UK prison system, a um, uh, model called therapeutic community approach. Uh, it's got strengths and weaknesses as an approach, but I really um, I, I think it's got a lot to be said for it. Um, this place called Grendon, um, yeah. uh, which is just an amazing place. And the, the unit I used to work in at Women's Scrubs, used to, uh, called the Max Clatt unit, 
which is run as a therapeutic community. And they're just amazing places to work in. Um, and that was more holistic. It was group work, um, both small groups every day, very intensive uh, group, work, group work every day and uh, large groups twice, two or three times a week. Um, 40 odd guys in the room. Uh, uh, um, and Talking about all sorts of things, their challenges, their, their weaknesses, their triggers and stuff. Yeah, anger, strength, strengths as well. But yeah, but in the small groups, we'd get into talk, talking about trauma, and I guess that's where my interest in trauma okay. developed. They Very taught me uh, against what I was being taught primarily academically, um, though it, there are different therapeutic models that mm. uh, incorporate different versions of the idea of trauma. Mm. It was the guys in the TC that taught me most, I think. Um, How interesting. About trauma. Okay. Yeah. So does that mean then, Lawrence? But Brendan's they, very much like that as well. Pardon yeah. me, sorry for cutting across you. So did they freely um, disclose things about their traumatic histories in the group? Um, because an interest I was going to ask you, and I will ask you a, a bit more about it later on, um, and the Compassion Prison Project and their kind of psychoeducation approach around ACEs and trauma. And, and whether it is a place and a value. Um, but sometimes I've heard people saying, you cannot talk about trauma in a prison. It's not a safe environment. And so like as a young psychologist, how did it come out? Did it come out in the groups where, you know, there was plenty of people in them all hearing this? I've actually written that myself. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that prisons are, are not a safe environment to talk oh, about trauma, is it? Yes, though, um, um, so partly rhetorically, I think. Mm. I would say that uh, in some ways, um, therapeutic community, well, well there's some, some aspects of prisons are very different from others. I mean, if you want to set up a regime that's kind of work, where all staff are buying into the model top to mm. bottom. Yeah. This is a kind of para, a sort of a sort of a military model of uh, management that you have in prisons, where you can yes. say, like, "This is what we do," and then everyone it offices everyone uh, buys into, it, yeah. including therapeutic models. So there's a number of um, prison um, settings where I think um, uh, really interesting safe spaces have been created, and um, uh, and in fact, what would happen is people would feel safe on the unit, but then it would be off the unit. Yes. Uh, that, that things mm. would be difficult so people would come back from visits for instance and talk about um, how they wanted to assault the prison officers or something we'd say well you know do you want to talk about that yeah. <laughs> two wrongs don't make a right you know yeah. That, that, <laughs> yeah, indeed those yeah. sorts of discussions but um but on the units yes people did and um in incredibly powerful ways uh, um um there was a de it was definitely a cult a culture uh, um the, the the way in which cc's work is you have a culture of uh, inquiry people are uh, curious about the why questions yeah. and uh what we would have is gradually work towards people doing a life life story where they would talk about how they got to be uh, the why right. and the way they were and um, and that would be in the large groups. Um, and, the, and so, yes, they would tell, um, and some people would avoid, uh, sure. would, and, and some people would embellish. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, um, but generally, there were incredibly powerful moments when people did that. And, um, but also there was processes of, you know, well, I know, I know where you're coming from. You're not, you're not saying it all because mm. I, I can see what, what, uh, what, you know, what you went through and mm. um, can, do you want to tell us about it? Yeah. I was there too and mm. it's my similar. So that whole, um, the therapeutic process of groups of where you can, uh, the kind of resonance with other yeah. people's experience um, worked. I, would say, I, I, I don't want to be too idealising, though, because I think for some people it wasn't um, uh, brilliant. Um, mm. Some people, either you would have people who couldn't cope with, weren't ready to talk, mm. and sometimes you would have people who would talk and then become incredibly dysregulated. Yes, activated by what they'd heard or what they'd said. Yeah. 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 Mm. And uh, that would lead to... I mean, we were working with people who, with substance misuse and violence and mm. uh, offend, sexual offending issues mm. all together. And sometimes people would play out those dramas in mm. therapy after talking about it. And uh, 
it was hard to hold on to them. Mm. Um, so I don't want to be too, uh, you know, idealizing of that. Yeah, as, sure. You know, but I, 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 it certainly taught me a huge amount. And I'm still involved with uh, Grendon Prison, which I think is an amazing place. Um, and uh, yeah, just thinking about um, and we're, um, that whole issue of um, people, uh, service users or uh, experts by experience helping each other. It's the Maxwell Jones's idea of um, the community as doctors, I think. Yes. Is his <laughs> yeah. yeah. And Fritzi Horseman has a phrase as well that healing occurs in community. So um, mm. when the group goes well, I guess, and when it has a safe containment, that that could, probably can be quite magical. But as you say, um, not without challenges either, depending yes. on what's revealed and how quickly and with what degree of intensity and everything. Uh, it's just why I ask is I met a man recently at an event and he'd been in prison and he'd been sexually abused as a boy, but never told anyone. Uh, all, all, all throughout his growing up and there were many other things as well but he got into addiction and into prison and was in a recovery group an AA meeting that he revealed it to the other men and then a bunch more said the same thing happened to me and I just found that really interesting given the kind of conservative nature of prison administrators at times saying no these places we know they're unsafe and if you don't have a psychologist who you can speak to a, a, these things about privately then you know no one no one else can hold it so uh, your reflections are are really interesting there Lawrence um can we just go back a bit to attachment um which is one of my favorite topics and i know not everyone buys into it to the same degree but as a psychologist from your experience um is it relevant to how how kids develop and how we go on to be able to have relationships healthy or otherwise as adults yes uh, of course and um uh, yeah, no, I'm definitely uh, in the uh, school of attachments um, important. Um, um, I think there's lots of um, evidence for that and, um, uh, you know, right the way, going right, going right the way back to Bowlby's work with, um, I think the phrase that he used to work with, delinquents, was it? <laughs> it's a slightly dated phrase, but... Um, but yeah, his observations and work, I thought this is really groundbreaking and for its time, um, uh, you know, recognising the effects of um, separation from parents at an early age and the harm that, that, that well, the impact that that can have. Um, so, uh, yes, and, and then there's the sort of, I really like the sort of work of people like Peter Fonagy's and uh, Bateman Fonagy's stuff about mentalisation of... Mm -hmm your ability to respond empathically and sympathetically to other people's worlds mm. uh, evolves out of your own experience of having been on the receiving end of that. And without that sort of experience of someone attending to you and recognizing your inner world, um, um, it's you just don't develop the language or skills or um, capacity to do that for, for other people in the same way. Um, so yes, I, I definitely think that um, that's important. And 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 yeah, I mean, if you look at questions about why do some kinds of trauma impact on people um, and not on other people, one of the answers to that is um, because uh, some people have experienced those traumas in the context of a secure relationship, and that has buffered and uh, helped people to make sense of and process and hold on to the belief that they're lovable and um, meaningful uh, people <laughs> in the world. Yeah. Um, so yes, I, I do think those that's um, a really critical um, area to be working with. Mm. And um, w one of the things, uh, as I understand it, that a forensic psychologist might work a lot with this is personality disorder, would that be right? And how there are, um, issues may be certainly I've, I've read some commentary um, particularly in relation to borderline personality disorder uh, where it's highly critical of this diagnosis that's often very gendered but also uh, hugely linked to complex 
um, traumatic stress. So um, caused by abuse and neglect in the home, often at the hands of the primary caregiver. But in relation to, to maybe men that you've worked with in the forensic setting, would things like um, disorganized attachment be a big feat? feature where people were afraid of their primary caregiver or, or, or had a fearful primary caregiver who was maybe um, the subject of domestic violence throughout childhood. Do, do, are those common features? Yes. Um, so, well, uh, yeah, um, I struggle with the category personality disorder, uh, as you suggested. Um, uh, however, yes, uh, complex trauma, I think, um, and attachment issue problems, are, I do go some way to describing what, identifying what the issues are for people. And um, yes, I mean, um, uh, well, it's more, more, I think it's, it's insecure or disorganized attachment in the context of multiple experiences of trauma. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, so, so where I work at, at uh, uh, Rampton and uh, uh, certainly actually, you know, where I was working with uh, serious offenders, uh, not that you can draw a th th thick line between serious and non-serious non yes. offenders, but um, uh, th there was a kind of, you know, if you could sort of typify then the life story, it would be um, uh, really uh, problematic and abusive experiences in the fa family of origin. Um, Violent, uh, violence, abuse, neglect, um, sometimes or, uh, sexual abuse. Um, and then that then resulting in people um, often going into care contexts um, uh, or in and out of care, where sadly um, there are people are exposed again to violent abuse, uh, sexual abuse, um, neglect of different kinds. <laughs> um, and then, you know, if you, if you sort of weave into that, the whole problem of sort of cultural back, backgrounds and, you know, people just being exposed to racism and sure. uh, um, uh, ableism and a whole range of other abusive experiences linked with that. Um, so that, the, and then sort of getting into sort of cycles of, of acting out to, as a way uh, in reaction to those experiences, sure. then being punished for them. Yeah. And then, and, and just repeatedly getting caught in patterns of of mm. of, of, of um, abusive experiences there, and then eventually going into um, prison setting, where it all just carries on: sexual abuse, violent mm. abuse, um, uh, in young offenders' institu institutions, uh, from the peer group as well as from um, the uh, sort of, um, uh, people running it, and then of course uh, into prison. Uh, <laughs> And that's all going on again there. And then you've got um, also the sort of um, deprivations linked with uh, not being exposed to the kinds of developmental experiences that one would hope would um, nurture people into different lifestyles. And it doesn't stop. It, mm. So, uh, you know, the, the idea of post-traumatic stress, I think, is problematic. It is, yeah. There is no post. <laughs> it's still ongoing, it's yeah. ongoing, yeah. And, um, you know, how do, how do, if you do the thought experiment, how would I survive in a high secure hospital mm -hmm. surrounded by people with very serious difficulties mm -hmm. or in a prison? Um, you know, I wouldn't feel safe anyway. <laughs> yes. And that again is an important point in terms of processing trauma or can these places become trauma informed when our nervous systems rightly would be either on edge and hypervigilant or we'd be shut down and, you know, in the corner trying to ignore it all, disconnect from it all. So um, it, it, it's highly challenging, all right, to, to think of really enjoying safety. And yet I have met men during my PhD who have felt safer in prison than on the outside, which tells us something, you know, um, who've done courses, who went to choir, who've done yoga and all sorts. And then they think they're ready to go back out, um, but something derails them on the outside. And maybe it's just institutionalization, but... Well, from an attachment perspective, yeah. the way I would think about that is if the prison does become a secure base, yeah, and it becomes home and people, sadly, that is uh, the safest place that people know. And, and so they crave it when they get mm. out. Yes. 
particularly if they have no one and they uh, they're gone back to their communities of origin where no one really wants them or where they fall back into the the patterns there the kind of regularity i think of the bed the three meals and the school or that type of thing can be soothing yes. um, when it's missing well, it's a, yeah, it's a feeling of belonging. And, yeah. and so, yes, attachments, this interesting point about attachments, is there's attachments to individuals, but there's also the cultural attachment and the, the feeling of belonging in the, to your community, mm. and, uh, as you mentioned earlier. And um, people will crave that feeling of belonging mm. uh, that, belong, that they feel in prison, mm. that they don't feel out on the street. One of the things I used to, in the, when I was working in a hostel, uh, we used you know, to take people after a, a, you know, a, a long sentence and they were so institutionalized um, uh, and attached to, to, to prison that, uh, you know, they would, uh, they didn't have to lock themselves in their rooms, but they would lock themselves in their rooms at night. Mm. Right. And in those days, they had slopping out uh, in yeah. prison. That was just, you know, <laughs> Pretty. Uh, so they would take really Grim. primitive, but yeah. these guys would take a bottle to their room at night time to go to the toilet into a bottle and then take it and put it down the toilet in the morning. Right. It was all just part of the routine and the ritual. It was, and... it was part of their being. Yeah. It was so it's in, it's ingrained in them. And we would try and sort of work with them to nudge them out of this. Yes. Things. Yeah. In fact, there was quite an interesting project then. I don't know if it's still, in, it probably isn't still in existence, but it was called Second House. That, that, that place where I worked was called Norman House. And there was a place linked with it called Second House where they used to take it, it uh, was um, people who were ex-lifers where they would try and give a sort of very structured ro regime to the day in the hostel mm. to give people that sense of safety and containment that they'd felt in prison. Uh, and it was a long-term project. So for lifers um, to live with each other and feel that sense of belonging outside perhaps mm. with, with other lifers, <laughs> yeah. uh, which uh, uh, was, you know, partly successful, I think. Um, Certainly, people described it as feeling quite contained by that. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you know one of the reasons for a, a reconviction is that we um, uh, attack people become attached to pr prison, um, yeah. and it's a kind of there's a kind of bereavement response when you go into prison where you just kick off. Yeah, <laughs> you say you're innocent. You fight to. <laughs> everybody you, whatever you end up with exclusion or segregation yeah. or whatever but then you kind of accept it and you sort of calm down but almost that fighting bit is actually quite healthy because you don't want people to get used to staying in prison or wanting yeah. to stay there if you want them to survive outside you want mm. them to be, to have something that um, they're clinging to, to on the outside yeah yeah, yeah. It's an interesting one. Um, the, the former head of the prison service um, at an event years ago on women in prison specifically said the women are often looking for their mommy and daddy in prison. And if they have positive relationships with, you know, the prison staff or the therapeutic staff or the school staff, then yeah. there's someone in the world and that becomes important to them. And then if they don't have that on the outside, it's not hard to see how how Go back. There, there is a draw or at least it's not it's not the same our idea of punishment isn't a true punishment if your life is in a sense that bleak or this is this is where you found some kind of connection because we can't do without connection I guess as as humans um can I ask you about the Compassion Prison Project, um, if you're familiar with it, I think you're, you probably are, Fritzi Horseman's work and the Step Inside the Circle and the, the, the um, kind of restorative circles that she runs. What's your view on this type of an initiative, Lawrence? I think, um, well, I've not personally been exposed to um, the whole sort of uh, experience of being part of one of those events. So yeah. I don't know, to be, mm. probably these are the safest. Yeah. I think there's something incredibly powerful though about people being able to um, acknowledge in um, that large group context, um, the reality of trauma in people's mm. backgrounds. That's just such a, um, without necessarily going and drilling down into the detail, sure. but just, uh, 
the, the, the light bulbs going on in, in the whole group about, mm. oh gosh, you know, I'm not alone with this. Yes. Um, um, so yes, I, I think that's just watching those um, videos is incredibly powerful. Um, and um, uh, I imagine has a very powerful impact on the people in, involved with that. Mm. Um, I think the, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the longer term um, working working through of that stuff, I think is um, uh, interesting. And I suppose, yeah, I suppose that's the important question is what happens with that knowledge and uh, in the long in the longer term, mm. what doors are opened by that? I suppose in, in terms of people um, coming to terms with things, because um, I think there's something about acknowledging it. But then there's the next thing is what do we? What how do, do you process it or digest it? Maybe or work yeah. through it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I suggested to the the prison service in Ireland that you know when Fritzy was coming over, it might be interesting to see about. Uh, having a go, uh, trying one, um, but there there was fears again that you know would it be a contained space? What would happen afterwards? Um, mm -hmm. Who who would who would work with people if they uh, they didn't use the phrase decompensated, but you know that type of thing. If if they um, I suppose what's often the phrase used by people who are fearful of this to me is you open the can of worms and then what there's no psychologist to work with all these people yes. would you be fearful of that yourself uh lawrence like if there was a big circle and 300 people went to it and only a few of them had access to a psychologist What's more troubling for people is when you begin to go back and sit and spend some time looking at the memories and mm. that sort of thing i imagine yeah. some people um just being reminded of 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 it will be um troubling and traumatic um, I think being in a large group is an incredibly containing experience mm. um, and uh, one processes things generally very differently in that context and uh, I've seen that definitely in terms of therapeutic communities using large groups mm. but having said that um, I wouldn't be surprised if there aren't um, a handful of people who do um, find it very triggering and mm. would take some time to to work with that but no uh, I guess um, yeah, um, that doesn't mean that it's not doable and uh, or, or sensible to do it. Um, but uh, you, you wouldn't expect everybody in that group to go down that road. Maybe a handful, but then going to I don't know English an English literature class would be triggering. Yes, reading a book about <laughs> some situation uh, yeah. that was similar to their yeah. own story. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Or, and you know, watching the news is difficult. So you, you uh, always people always being exposed to trauma, actually, yes, uh, um, so prison, true. Uh, and from each other and and through the media. So there should be provision. I think the the the, the response to that was there should be provision in prisons anyway for mm. people of that trauma, mm. um, not just for those kinds of events. Though you would perhaps be on alert. Um, mm. And if it's in a trauma informed context, you would be sensitive to people who had really been were really struggling after after that. Well, the the um, Scottish group that Fritzi has partnered with, one of them is Cisco Recovery and they do recovery cafes. They're kind of experts by experience who provide services in the prisons anyway. Yep. So I suppose there is follow up potentially there, even where yep. people don't have their own psychologist but certainly a few years ago Scotland was not really tuned into trauma or, or thinking that they could do these types of things either you know so it's interesting um the 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 pace of change and in one of the videos um the, the step inside the circle video I, I mention it all the time really there's an elderly man uh, an African-American man somewhere in his 70s who says this was the happiest day of my life because he stepped inside the circle got his a score was told about the stress response system and what trauma does to the brain and body and behavior and relationships and it all made his whole life made sense mm. you know it, to me it seems terrible that someone should have to end up 70 in you know in prison most of their life to have this yeah. knowledge um is there a place for more general psychoeducation programs, do you think, for for prisoners, even if they don't specifically access psychology services or psychiatry? 
Uh, yes, um, I think, though, again, one needs to be careful about uh, how, how, how you do that mm. um, and the kind of support that's around. But, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I definitely think that. I, I almost feel it's a right. Um, mm. the, the, when I think about uh, this this whole issue, it's, it's around um, this, the sort of litany of injustice in the backgrounds of people's yeah. lives, uh, often undetected injustice. Yeah. It's not actually resulted in convictions. So you get a whole series of, of abusive experiences and then someone does something horrible. Yeah. You hear about the, that horror, but you don't actually hear about the... So um, true. They're all offences, neglect, sexual abuse, violent abuse, yeah. um, undetected, unconvicted crime. Uh, so it's a massive injustice. Mm. And so there's a kind of uh, there's a kind of restorative justice bit of me that thinks yeah. we should be saying sorry to people about yes. that, um, some kind of uh, acknowledgement of it, not sweeping it under the carpet. Mm. Um, and that uh, that I think is really re really important. One of the things that I've said before is that very often um, people are not just perpetrators, but they're victims too, and particularly where um, they might have committed acts of violence, that very rarely does that come out of a place of kind of health and wholeness and, and being kept safe and loved in childhood. Mm -hmm. um, from your clinical and, and forensic experience, would that kind of play out in terms of what you, you know about people? Yes, uh, I think, um... Well, yeah, and there's a whole range of different things that contribute to people becoming um, violent. But yes, very commonly, that's um, uh, um, to do with people's experiences of being not just singular experiences, mm. repeated. Cumulative. Yeah, experiences. And going back to you, sort of um, what you were saying about attachment, I think uh, there's one, I think, important pattern, which is something like if you can't feel safe, to uh, get a secure, uh, an attachment experience, you switch to using things like dom dominance behavior, okay. a way of me feeling safe. So, um, uh, yeah, so you, you get into a pattern of not meeting your needs through, um, not being able to meet your safety needs and resource needs through, through attachment. So you get what you need through, uh, and particularly safe, safety, mm. through force and violence. And I think that's a common, common theme. For, for people um, and typically when people think about uh, trauma and offending it's simply it's thinking about the threat system and and attachment and the way those sort of interact with each other um, and I think that's true so you get the, the you know the, 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 the typical thing is a typical uh, common theme is people who've been violently abused uh, developing this kind of propensity to being easily triggered mm. Um, scanning their environments all the time for the possibility of violence, um, and that's a kind of uh, a legacy of of uh, of childhood from when they were sat at the top of the stairs waiting for dad to come home and mm. beat them up after coming home from the pub or whatever. That kind of uh, bodily experience of fear and 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 uh, 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 hyper vigilance. But I think there's a whole range of other ways in which um, different types of trauma can impact on on uh, lead to offending. Mm. Um, so f f with dominance, I think, for instance, people not only becoming dominant and using dominance to meet their needs, but also in the context of neglect, getting away with that repeatedly. Mm. Um, so there's lack of boundaries. Right. As a child, you're just being left uh, to, to your own devices and then patterns of behavior developing in that context of right. um, uh, getting away with things uh, repeatedly um, and that then shaping your personality in a particular particular way as well. So not only don't you have an attachment experience, but you use, you're discovering ways of using dominance and power and quite to, to, to meet feelings of status and feelings of uh, belonging um, uh, and safe and safe as well as safety um, so um, I think uh, the, the, the and I think that's another sort of human trait so we think about attachment as a human characteristic that's evolved the fear systems evolved but I think status is also something that is very human uh, yes. 
every group has jostling for power and yeah. <laughs> you can't get away from it in the world. But I, I think there's such a thing as malignant power, uh, the, yeah. the interest and, and addiction almost to, mm. to different types of power experience, which you really get out of hand. So I think that gets complicated with some offending. Sure. And then similarly with... Um, there's also sadly um, evidence that uh, people's sexual experiences and um, uh, identities and um, yeah, sexual interests can be harmed by uh, early sexual experiences. Sure. It doesn't get spoken about um, enough, but uh, I think um, for some people, I think that can be really, um, really difficult um, to deal with. Not, not only have they been sexually abused, but gone on to be perpetrators of. Sure abuse and uh, those early experiences have in some ways shaped um, that's not to say all people who've offended and, and not everyone who's been abused will end up perpetrating but uh, in the context of no, no attachments to help you process it and repeated experiences and that sort of thing I think it can have really harmful impact not just on attachment and a threat system but also on one's sexual yeah uh, sure the, the scripts that are developed in in, uh, in 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 life. Another thing that I think isn't really um, spoken a, enough about is the fact that women moms can be very violent too. And you know, so like I'm a feminist. I believe in keeping uh, women and girls safe. Um, but I wonder how much of very angry, aggressive behavior can be actually charted to some um, brutal behavior by moms rather than dads, maybe some of the time, and how that might be challenging to speak about because it doesn't fit in with um, maybe the, the, the narratives around gender based violence. It, would that be a, in some of the backstories that you've encountered, Lawrence? Uh, I typically don't work with women, so mm -hmm. I'm not my area of expertise. Um, but um, certainly, colleagues would would definitely agree with that, and and um, uh, who do who do work with with women, and um, particularly, yeah, that kind of caricature that women aren't capable of um, of doing some of those things, and mm -hmm. yes, they, they can and uh, and do and. And certainly also in the backgrounds of men who've been sexually abused by women, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, uh, that's also sort of um, something that's, that's around. And um, yeah, it gets underreported, uh, under underdisclosed, um, um, and it in some ways can be harder for people to talk about because of these cultural char characteristics and um, different versions of toxic max masculinity which are sort of mask and hide and or, or even uh, condone some kinds of sexual activity uh, at an early age and, and that sort of thing um so yes have i answered your question <laughs> yeah you have it's it, it's it's simply like um i don't know if you saw the documentary cracked up on netflix uh, about the comedian daryl hammond but it was his mom who from a very early age was extremely violent and um he was rep repeatedly hospitalized and he developed addiction self-harm you know he had every uh, diagnosis known to man given to him but no one had asked really about trauma and he he um a very funny comic the longest serving member of saturday night live but he you know he was just saying the worst thing was being expected not to tell um and there's another documentary on netflix um uh, tell me who i am about maternal uh sexual abuse of of the sons um a, a kind of an aristocratic background um, but I just bring it up because there's well-known um, violence by men against women and girls, but those men are created somehow. And I just think uh, we know some of the cultural things, patriarchy that can create male dominance and violence, but, but you could also maybe learn to hate women and girls because of how you were treated by your caregiver, I suspect, is, is yes. interesting. Um, yes, that's uh, often, and, and there's also, um, yeah, there's a whole range of ways in which uh, 
people feel um, hurt and abused by by their mothers as well as their fathers in different ways at being uh, given up or abandoned mm, or, of course. or not believed as well is uh, yes. incredibly um, sometimes worse the, mm. the not being believed than the actual experience um, for some people the, the betrayal trauma linked with that I suppose um, yes not protected when when someone disclosed something and maybe the mom didn't leave the partner or whatever else that type of yeah situation yeah there are feminist critiques of the idea of a, just simply thinking of a simplistic versions of attachment, which is mother blaming and, yes. uh, and which we need to be very mind, mindful of as well. That it's um, thinking more systemically about, uh, you know, the context in which people are, are, are in and um, how people have behaved in the way they are because they have, haven't had any or are being abused themselves mm. in different ways and or ha, and obviously experienced abuse mm. um, in their pasts. Um, so yes, uh, um, I think that's that's a really important area to be and uh, um, yeah, that sort of historical thing of of um, sort of not acknowledging or accepting that well, women are mad and men are bad. I think yeah. is. <laughs> caricature yeah. isn't it so mm. um and do you think um Lawrence that the therapeutic relationship is like in your setting let's say in the forensic setting that it can be um a kind of a key change agent for people especially where maybe the therapist can um or the psychologist can help with affect regulation that is something that Bessel van der Kolk said in a training that I did that this capacity to help with affect regulation was really important um, like in the in a clinical mental health context or in a prison or you know secure hospital is the relationship between the psychologist or psychiatrist and the person before them as well understood um, and elevated as it should be do you think all the research into psychotherapy shows that one of the most powerful uh, agents of change um, is um, therapeutic relationship and um, the quality of the therapeutic relationship. Indeed, something like 60, 70 percent of if the, the treatment effect size is down to, to that. It doesn't matter what therapy, it's mm. the relationship that's yeah. the quality of the relationship that's going to make a difference. So, uh, yes, I would agree with that. Um, I think. Um, uh, what I would say, though, is it's thinking carefully about um, different people's responses to therapeutic relationships, because I think some people, particularly people with um, disorganized or um, uh, insecure, some kinds of insecure attachment, will, um, or more particularly where they, the, 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 they've been trauma in the context of attachment experiences, that when they start forming a relationship with a therapist, that all gets triggered off. Yeah. And, a process where people um, uh, uh, um, are triggered and, and will then sort of end things yes. or, and create distance because they just can't, uh, because it's Too much. Triggering. Yeah. It's the, because uh, the, the attachment system gets triggered and then the trauma that's that's been in, sort of locked away in that gets, it all comes back to the mm -hmm. surface and then there's a replaying of that. So um, I think there's, um, so as Guidano Liotti sort of talked quite a bit about this, but to, to, you know the way in which dissociative responses to um, uh, early uh, uh, to, to uh, attachment experiences, which are triggered by um, uh, being reminded or brought back to life in in, in the um, the therapeutic context, can actually lead to people um, uh, dropping out of therapy and that sort of thing. And so it's something about modulating how much uh, intimacy, I suppose, there is and yeah. structure and sometimes even using more than one therapist with some people initially whilst they build up the skills and, and containing people through that initial reaction uh, that some people can have to, to it. Sorry, it's a slightly long-winded response, but I think it's just... Yeah, no, I, I, it makes <laughs> total sense to me. Um, <laughs> it, it wouldn't have a few years ago, I don't think. And yet, like, even without a whole pile of trauma, people have their relational patterns and kind of can be activated by things, you know, can be super sensitive to criticism, or if they feel dismissed, if someone's busy and they don't have time for them, that can trigger abandonment. 
pretty yeah. much really if someone has an ex extensive trauma history can't absolutely anything be a trigger really you know yeah. from aftershave smell to you know whatever words that a person uses yes. can bring back a kind of memory that they they didn't even know they had yes. and and would would everyone or most people working in the mental health setting whether whether in the, the community or in prison know that would they know that repetition compulsion is quite likely not sure most people would use that phrase okay. uh, some people will have experienced it and have an intuitive knowledge of it <laughs> mm. um, and then some practitioners i think will have uh, different kinds of uh, ways of thinking about that that kind of process there's sort of more psychodynamic models and more okay. trauma focused models which simply go down a similar kind of road mm -hmm. Uh, let's think about trauma in slightly different ways, but essentially, yes. Um, but going back to, I suppose, the heart of your question is, are we doing enough? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in fact, there's some really interesting sort of, uh, well, there's an interesting chapter actually I was reading um, recently, which got me thinking about this um, uh, on the idea of attachment informed care, um, which okay. is essentially arguing something like what you said. Um, that uh, people uh, are trained more in terms of being aware of the importance of attachment, mm. the, the emotional regulatory sort of side of it. Um, so there would have been, for instance, what would have been a time when I suggest to staff um, when they're dealing with it, someone who's struggling, you know, well, talk to them about what's wrong. But now I might just say, talk to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not about what's Connect. wrong. Yeah. It's just spend some time with them, talk about football, talk about, uh, but just as a ground, bringing grounding process. Um, so that that kind of thing. There's a, a colleague of mine uh, in uh, Rampton who's, who's a nursing colleague who did a really good piece of work on transitions. So what typically what you get in prison and secure settings is whole range of transitions from uh, they're called name nurses uh, so you get one name nurse after another um, mm -hmm. and they get changed every x number of months and and then people move from one place one ward to another and then from one hospital to another sure. and all every time they form some kind of containing relationship um that, there's a good Oof, you know it's gone yeah and that they're just repeatedly exposed to re re repetitive experiences of loss and and rejection or about well not they may experience it as rejection uh, loss and abandonment um and sometimes maybe you can't avoid that but what she's doing is thinking about ways of trying to um help people prepare for that uh it's a, I suppose it's attachment um yeah. psycho aid for the person on mm. themselves as well but also doing you know when people have moved not just forgetting about them but yes. going to visit a few times and gradually nice. weaning people off you yeah. <laughs> And I remember um, thinking about Grendon, actually, there's the whole, um, uh, I remember having a debate with because of the reconviction rates of people after the release wasn't, went, and there's still, it was a, there was a treatment effect, but we were thinking about, you know, quite a few people were still reoffending, And so the whole question was, is it better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all? <laughs> totally, totally is better. <laughs> For uh, my scientific opinion, <laughs> <laughs> as a human, uh, as a human, yeah. Uh, but it was thinking about because what they do at Grendon is to give them the most powerful attachment experience. Well, not just Grendon in therapy yeah. is different. It's not just an attachment experience. It's probably for some people the most powerful attachment experience they've ever had. Yeah. And then you say goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, put them out on the street. Um, there's something about that that uh, could be done very diff very differently, I think. Yeah. Uh, there's something about con continuous linking with people right the way through the whole process, not fragmenting them into these bits that uh, aren't really talking to each other, which yeah. parallel what's going on inside them sometimes. I, well, I, I, I love that point because I would definitely say absolutely worth giving that precious attachment experience, but you're right, cutting it off so abruptly is cruel, you know, and, and may undermine the good work that was done. Now, some people might offend anyway, but from my own research, that transition is difficult for anyone. It would be difficult for any of us, I think, you know. Um, it's traumatic. 
it is traumatic the security and the holding gone and then you know you're meant to just function fine so yeah maintaining in some even a few visits afterwards i know they were doing that in the ips and the in the irish prison service for a while with some um some people who'd been with psychologists for a number of years that they'd maybe have six post-release appointments in the community and it struck me as a nice way to just check in on people and 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 keep the connection yes. going at a very fragile time for them yeah. do you think that everyone should be um given trauma training if they work with populations like prisoners and people with mental health problems um, and, and, and the social care field is a kind of necessary information to have? Yes, I, I do. Um, I think um, it's really important to help people to understand um, the presentations of the people they're working with and make sense of them. Um, I don't know, so six, seven years ago um, on the Peaks Unit where I used to work um, at Rampton, we, we started doing trauma awareness training for all stuff. Um, and people would think about people they were working with. But the interesting thing there was also becoming aware of trauma in their, their own lives. Sure. And there was something recently that's sort of really sort of opened my eyes to the, how important that is, is that someone did some research um, looking at trauma in the backgrounds of people who start to work in, who, who work in high secure. Um, right secure settings so this is prior to the exposure so, so normally we think about oh they make the, the, the client group of the people mm. who traumatize us and that's true mm. uh, but there was a much higher uh, numbers of aces in the backgrounds of people who are actually being attracted to the work in the first place so doesn't surprise me and i think that's true in prisons uh, as well in terms of prison officers and um as a high sense a lot, a lot of them ex soldiers and god knows what uh, sure. in the uk mate uh, and um so yes, working with trauma is about not just working, uh, making sense of, uh, uh, it's working with the whole system and uh, um, trauma awareness uh, among staff, um, among, about themselves, uh, uh, how that they get triggered by stuff yeah. that they're working with, as well as making sense of when this person's shouting at you um, and you don't know where it's come from, you can say, and you think, this, you know, this isn't me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's such useful information. It you makes it easier. Because <laughs> you've got me wrong, you know, how dare you? Um, yeah. Well, that's why they got you wrong. Yeah. And to know that is such a critical piece of information to change your response mm. to them. And so staff were, have, have uh, um, we've been doing lots of trauma awareness training at Rampton and uh, stuff, general response from staff has been, you know, why didn't we learn this earlier? Why wasn't it on our nursing training? I mean, I, I didn't know that. I, I assumed as a psychologist that they would have had that on their nursing training, but no, they hadn't. And um, But I'm, I, I'd say some provisos. I mean, there was an interesting um, comment that somebody made on LinkedIn recently. We were talking about what happens when if you train people about trauma awareness, but then you don't give anyone the capacity to do anything about it. That's kind of give people a sense of moral injury or a mm. sense of helplessness, and you know what are we doing to staff by t or giving them that knowledge, but then not. Mm. I think there is some some issues there. I think it's 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 training people in awareness, but also giving people ongoing skills in, yeah. in what to do with it. Mm. And I also don't think it's the only answer. Um, I did at one point. We used to have a, a little logo at the bottom of our emails that say "trauma aware." Oh no, trauma informed. Yeah. And I changed that now. It's so aspiring to be trauma informed <laughs> yes. because I, I don't think trauma awareness is the, is the only bit of the. In fact, I'm not sure what, where where we're going with this, but because I'm not sure what the best outcomes. I think we're, I'm certainly still on a journey to work, working that out. Mm. But reflective practice, I think, is really important. Mm. Uh, opportunities for people to talk and mm. process what's going on in the day to day. Mm. Uh, the way in which trauma has been played out mm. uh, in the day to day and, and actually do something with it and think about it and make sense of it. And mm. um, also uh, linking that in with whole issues around uh, racism and. Yes, uh, I was just about to ask. Dissectionality yeah. and stuff. There's a really good paper that opened my, my eyes to that a few years back by Kiros. Um, um, just saying, you know, just I think it's called disrupting the trauma narrative. Uh, through the critical race lens or something mm. like that. 
really saying, look, that literature just didn't mention racism for years. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Because all about? it was white supremacist trauma literature almost in a way. Yeah, let's yeah. let's. And uh, so I've been on a journey with colleagues that were out to recently. We're really just going back to the drawing board and saying, you know, what what the hell has been going on here? Where, where have we? And that not, that's not to say we haven't been trying to work on some of those issues mm -hmm. in the past, but not in as explicit and uh, thoughtful way, I suppose, about about some of that. Um, and so, yeah, when I say I'm on a journey, I think I'm still trying to discover what the best uh, the best version of tra what being trauma informed is, and and how to keep it alive as well. Because as soon as you do training, it sort of just crumbles away, and <laughs> you have to retrain people, and you have to. Uh, well, I think reflective practice is a good way of making it alive and keeping it uh, keeping it alive. Yeah, I, I, I agree that it's uh, tricky. And I suppose one of the things, I mean, I tune into this a lot and try and learn from what I read and hear from people. But certainly what I like uh, as a sort of way of understanding trauma is um, if if we feel profoundly unsafe in our bodies around other people, that is going to impact um, all manner of things, our health, our behavior, our capacity for relationships. And how could racism not profoundly impact people? You know, how could it not? Or being deeply poor and highly stressed all the time and with no food. So I, I, I agree with you. It's not just ACEs or anything like that. It has to be quite wide and, um, and, and reflective. Just one final question then for you, Lawrence, and thanks so much for, for sharing um, your, your wonderful, important work and insights with me. What can politicians and policymakers do, do you think, to kind of increase the likelihood that children will have safe starts in life and be able to live healthy lives and connected lives as adults? Um, gosh. Um, <laughs> it's a big one. <laughs> it's a big one, yeah. Um, well, I think trauma awareness, well, I, I really, um, I, you may have seen on Twitter, I've got uh, Scotland envy. Uh, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, the, as a start anyway, I think a national strategy uh, where everybody talks about trauma, um, training, um, not just uh, in hospitals and uh, prisons, but, you know, dentists, I, mean, I wish someone had talked to me about that. <laughs> dental trauma, <laughs> I'm still have trouble with that one, I've got, it's triggering already just talking about it. Um, but yeah, dentists, policemen, uh, firemen, um, uh, you know, uh, emergency services workers, doctors, teachers, everybody um, having some kind of, uh, and it sort of makes me think actually it's some analogy, uh, you know, historically people used to talk about sex education, so no one knows anything about sex, we never talk about it, well let's talk about trauma uh, in that kind of, uh, that kind of way. The other thing I think is that also, I think uh, existential traumas of like mortality, we just don't talk about that. Uh, that needs talking about, I think. You know, COVID's really brought that, the sure. trauma, the reality of mortality, which most people are just sort of put in boxes and yeah. hide away from. Actually, I think that's so important for us to have um, frameworks and approaches to accepting and working with because it comes out in such uh, disturbed mm -hmm. ways if we don't, I think. Yeah. Um, so, Sorry, I'm rumbling a bit, but I think the, uh, the 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 politicians could be thinking very systematically. And I have tried this. I've written to MPs about this uh, in the in in England. Uh, be careful how I talk about countries here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> good for you, though. Yeah, good for you for picking up the pen or the email. Yeah. Uh, so I have contacted people. Uh, there's a. Um, an MP who's, who, who, who has a, a cross-party group looking at um, psychological issues and, and uh, contacted her about uh, a trauma strategy. And then there's various other people who are thinking about or trying to nudge things in that direction. Still don't feel like that's got anywhere, but um, uh, um, at least we've, yeah, we've, we've tried. And I think that's what we should be doing is yeah. trying to nudge there's lots of interesting stuff happening at the moment uh, in a sort of piecemeal way. And wouldn't it make so much sense to 
uh, pull it all together and um, have a national, well, the, the kind of acknowledgement of it as well at that kind of a national level would, would make a big difference, I think. Yeah. Um, I think uh, investment um, with working with young young people more much more investment at working with young people and acknowledging that, that you know that even if you're coming at it from a very blinkered narrow-minded financial perspective yeah. <laughs> you're going to save so much money yes. <laughs> uh, if you invest a, a lot of money at uh, prevention and mm. um, and intervention mm. at, at an early stage as long as it's um, well thought through intervention yes um, the, um, the other attempts I've, I've made uh, of also trying to get the media to think and talk differently about trauma. We had um, a couple of years back, uh, s s some people from the Division of Forensic Psychology met up with the National Union of Journalists. We had a, a, a meeting in London and uh, they called it uh, Why Done It? <laughs> okay. yeah. It's a bit risky actually because there was some, uh, well, I did worry about where it would end up. Um, uh, but no, I mean, we're just talking about, you know, why don't you, when you report crime, mm. talk about the backstory? Yes. Um, because it just is is such a a misdescription of, of what happened if you yeah. don't talk about the whole story. Mm. Um, kind of it's just focusing on a snapshot of, right. of a broken story. Yeah, I was going to say a bit of, of um, I interviewed... Um, Lucy Johnston before and she used the phrase epistemic injustice and I think there is a degree of that you know where only only the worst bits of a person's behavior get told but none of the the stuff really leading up to it other than in Ireland they'll say stuff like poverty and a single parent and stuff that type of you know a, a man of low means or a woman of low means the same old same old but none yeah. of the sort of stuff that really made the difference in their in their yeah. formation of identity and everything and behavior. Yes, it's back to that um, unacknowledged, uh, yeah, epistemic. Well, not just it's legal injustice. It is. In, it's not epistemic. It's real yeah. injustice. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, definitely, <laughs> when there's consequences to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Liberty. Litany of crimes that have been committed against someone, and, and then they do something horrible. Well, why don't we look at why why they did it? Yes. Why did it? Um, and there was lots of interest actually amongst the journalists um, in that uh, across the political spectrum to some extent, I think. But um, um, so, yes, I think there's uh, big, big changes that could happen in terms of how we think about and talk about um, people who have offended. OK, well, Lawrence Jones, thank you so much. For, for being with me today and thank you for the important work you do and for being reflective and being on this journey and keep on with those emails and events and you know um because i do think it's it's taking some kind of shape in various places and um yeah this has been relationships matter with me jane mulcahy and my guest was lawrence jones thank you for tuning in uh, bye bye